to life that paid my way death its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins were gone my sins forgot there is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense so i come to tell you he's alive to tell the blind that heals the sick the lonely find it has the power to free the bound as chains they fall fall on the ground so pour it out to clear my soul and let his liquid glory 
was a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he ran again and rose to stand in a mighty pain. So I come to tell you he's Amen. Good morning and happy Easter. We are so glad that you are here with us to worship this morning the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here. If you are a guest, we want to welcome you. And we want to invite you to join us in weeks to come. But this morning, we want to ask you to take just a moment in your worship bulletin to tear off that portion and fill it out. Let us know who you are and let us know that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Also, uh, kind of a celebration that we have in the life of our family, of our church family this week, is the birth of a new baby. And we want to congratulate Brent and Brandy Sinclair at the birth of their daughter, Lexington, Lexington Joselle. So if you see them this week, congratulate this family, pray for them. We are glad you are here this morning. In just a minute, as we stand and greet one another, we're going to ask you again, if there are some empty seats next to you, will you just scoot next to the person beside you and, and wish them a happy Easter? Won't you stand and join us this morning? Where is your sting and 
Him. Who came to bless him? 
who came to bless him. Sing like never before. Oh, more than dressing up. Come on, church. Oh, my soul. I worship your holy name. The sun's going to come up. Oh, yeah. The sun comes. Come on, church. Sing it out. There's a new day dawn. It's time to sing. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. continue with our uh, worship this morning with uh, prayer and uh, through our giving 
Um, if you are a guest with us, um, please just fill out um, the, the card that you can, they can tear off from your bulletin and place that in the offering plate as it comes around. And that is your uh, gift to us this morning. And now speaking to the members of First Hearst, please just uh, remember that today is the end of our uh, budget year. And so we want to finish strong. And so um, with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, Lord God, we, God, we love you and we thank you for uh, God today. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to, to die in our place. God, to take our penalty for sin. God, that we may be set free. And God, that we may walk in freedom and walk into obedience with you. And God, we thank you for the resurrection. Because, Lord, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then the cross would have been void. But the resurrection shows us that Christ defeated death once and for all. Once and for all. Something that we could have never done. And so God, in your love, in your grace, in your mercy for us, God, you provided a way for us to be reconciled back to you. And so God, my prayer this morning is that our hearts would burn for you. That our hearts would absolutely burn for you and want to know the creator of the universe. And God, that we would worship your holy name. And, and, and Lord, that we, that we wait. Because God, one day your son is coming back. And he's going to make all things new once and for all. But until then, we wait with anticipation. Your word says that creation groans in waiting for the Lord. And so, God, we wait. And, God, I pray that we would wait patiently and that we would wait faithfully. And, God, we worship your name. God, I pray that your name would be made much of in this place this morning, God, because we know that you are exactly who you say that you are. And so, God, I pray that this morning that you would shine a light on the things in our heart, God, that is keeping us far from you. God, that we would find the things that stir our affections for you and that we would run to those. So, Lord, be with us this morning in this place. May your name be glorified. We ask all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus Hallelujah, praise and 
Bigger than. Sounds like a description of Texans bragging on themselves. But things are bigger. We believe te- things are bigger and better in Texas. Uh, the, the fact is that Texas is bigger than, than any European country. In fact, Texas used to be a country all into itself. Uh, there's some folks that think it ought to go back that way, but that's a discussion for another day. Things are bigger in Texas. Trucks are bigger in Texas. Hair is, well, not my hair, but the ladies' hair is bigger in Texas. <laughs> High school football is bigger in Texas. You, you drive across the state of Texas, and in essence, you have driven across one-third of the United States. Now, now, this is no offense to you foreigners from Louisiana and Arkansas. We're, <laughs> we're, we're glad you got here. But I just love everything about Texas. Now, now not everything, I'm sorry. There, there's about 5,000 different kind of snakes in the world, and 4,998 of them are found in Texas. But, but think about things unique to Texas. I mean, the, the opener. Now, Major League Baseball is opening its season tonight in Texas, of course, between the Rangers and, and, and the Astros. But, but technically, the, the opener really describes the first day of deer season, which is a recognized religious holiday in November for many of you. I love Texas. I love the fact that we have our own language, y'all. 
Fixing it, you know, everything, fixing, uh, fixing to. Uh, that, that's just one word. Just look in the Texas, Texas Dictionary. Or, or, or jeet, jeet. That, that's one word that actually is a phrase that asks the question, did you eat? And, and, and sweet tea is the, the official beverage of the state of Texas. Texans begin drinking it when they're two. In fact, I've seen some babies nursed on Texas tea. Um, <laughs> in Texas, we've only got four spices. We got salt, pepper, Tabasco, and picante. That is all we got. That is all we need. It, it's great to be a Texan. Now, not everybody was privileged to be born in the great state of Texas, but those of us that were recognized what a great grace gift of God it is. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, in fact, somewhere on the birth certificate of every Texan, it, it's in the small print, but somewhere it reads, born to brag. <laughs> and we typically do. And so that's why I know that Jesus was not a Texan. He, he created Texas, but there was no braggadocious bone in all of his body. He was humble. He was gentle. But if anybody, in fact, more than all the Texans put together, had bragging rights, no one bigger than our Jesus, especially on Easter morning. For in essence, the resurrection proclaims, Jesus says, I am bigger than I am bigger than whatever you're facing. I'm bigger than your debts. I'm bigger than your doubts. I'm bigger than your disease. I'm bigger because it's illustrated in the fact that I was bigger than that rock that they rolled in front of my tomb. It's a rock that is spoken of in both Matthew and Mark's accounts of the gospel in the last chapters of each of those books. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 57, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Now, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. This was going to cost him dearly to identify with this, Reagan, with this uh, renegade rabbi, this one who has now been crucified as a common criminal. But going to Pilate, Joseph asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it should be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance. Now, there's no way Joseph could have done that on his own. Now, it actually did have a groove. It was somewhat circular in nature. But this stone weighed between one and a half and two tons. And so perhaps Joseph and some of the other disciples rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and then they went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. In Mark, the 16th chapter, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, very early on Sunday morning, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? That is the dilemma of the stone. Who will roll the stone away? But verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. He is bigger than that rock and all that it represents. The futility, the finality, the fear, the failure. He is bigger than what it represented on that day and what it represents in this day. He is bigger, for example, than the declaration of condemnation that may come against you because it came against him. There was one after another who declared that he was to be sentenced to death. It began with those false witnesses at the trials that they couldn't even get their stories to agree with one another. And then Caiaphas, the high priest that year, concerned of the, of the rising popularity of Jesus and that there might be an uprising among the people, and then that the Roman rulers might come in and squelch that mob. He said to the Sanhedrin, is it not better? Do you not realize that it is better for one man to die than for the entire nation to perish? So he declared this sentence against Jesus. It moved from there to the elders and the chief priests, uh, those that stirred the people up and encouraged them to, to call for the release of the insurrectionists, the famous notorious criminal Barabbas, and instead call for the execution of Jesus. It was a sentence, it was a declaration of condemnation that came from the Roman soldiers who, who stripped him, who mocked him, who beat and spit upon him. It was a declaration that came from the mob themselves as they called out to crucify him. It was a declaration by Pilate as he recognized that it was only envy that the religious leaders had brought Jesus to him. And even though he found no validity to the accusations against Christ, nevertheless, he gave them what they wanted, and he handed him over to be crucified. One declaration after another resulted in a sentence of death. 
Has anyone pronounced a sentence upon you in recent days that you're not worthy? You're not good enough to marry my daughter. You're not good enough to be in our sorority. You're no longer needed in our employment. I have found someone else. I don't want you. You're expendable. You're done. You're gone. You're no longer needed. And there's one declaration after another that what it results in is that this, this huge rock that hovers above your heart and it blocks out the light so that it seems that you live in the shadow of hopelessness. This is the dilemma of the stone. Or if not a declaration of condemnation, those who would criticize and condemn you. Perhaps instead it is the uh, being devoid of resources, this very destitution, a destitute state in which destitute simply means to be, to be void of resources, and Jesus was materially. The destitution near the end of his life, here was a man, he identified so well with the poor because he had chosen to be one of them. He was one who had no home. Jesus said the foxes have their holes, the birds of the air have their nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In the end, at the cross, the only thing materially that he possessed were the clothes that he wore, and even those were separated and gambled over by the soldiers at the cross. Not only was there no place to lay the Son of Man's head as he was living, but when he had been crucified, there was nowhere to lay him once he was dead. The culture called for common criminals once they had been crucified to be left to the dogs and the vultures. But Joseph of Arimathea, now a disciple of Christ, came and asked for the body of Jesus. And he placed the Lord in the tomb that Joseph had created for himself. So Jesus you could say in a pauper's grave, in that he had no place to be laid. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus understood very well. He had nothing. So much so that it is understandable how that he understands, he identifies with your destitute state. He had nothing. Ironic somewhat that he who created the entire world in the end had nothing at all. He became poor. Identified well with the poor because he was one of them himself. For Paul wrote to the church at Corinth the second time and said that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now his poverty, his destitute state, it was not simply circumstantial, it was a part of the providential plan of Almighty God. That's probably not the case for you. If you find yourself in a state of destitution, Resources depleted. It's probably not the plan of God. Rather, it is perhaps as a result of mounting medical bills or the cost associated with a divorce or bad investments or unemployment. Some of these may have been your own choosing, others beyond your control. Nevertheless, you find yourself destitute of resources that you once had, and you wonder if there's any way out. What do you do? You do as did the psalmist who said, I call to the rock that is higher than I. But there's a rock that is bigger than your circumstances, bigger than the lack of your resources. There's a rock who is called the Savior in spite of the dilemma of the stone. It may be the declaration of those who pronounce sentences upon you, condemnation of you, even though Romans 8 tells us there is no condemnation to those in Christ. There is maybe perhaps this, this dilemma for you is being destitute of resources that you've become accustomed to. Or perhaps your dilemma this morning is, is the distress of your soul. Jesus has had been before he went to the cross. For in Matthew 26, verse 36, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go there to pray. He took Peter and James and John with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled and then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. The word sorrow here refers to physical pain or spiritual sorrow. And it can be caused by hunger or thirst, heat or cold, worry or anxiety, death or insults and outrages, everything that Jesus was having to contend with. All of this came against him. No, no wonder the word said that he was troubled which in the Greek can also be translated, he was distressed. 
to the point that it says he was overwhelmed, the way some of you feel today. Overwhelmed, the word literally means an affliction beyond measure. There's no way that you and I could have measured his misery. Not, not just the, the physical agony, it was horrific. But beyond that, and much worse than that, was the sin. Your sin, my sin, the world's sin. The burden of billions, of billions, of billions of people that not only weighed upon his shoulders, but literally broke his heart. No way to measure the misery. But worse than even the sin was the separation. Because from time eternal, God the Father and God the Son were perfectly united. Triune God, one God, three persons. I can't explain it. I just believe it because I know it's true. God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father, all, all one. And yet at this point, for Jesus told his followers, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And yet in spite of this, this unity that had been there since before time began, at this point, at the cross, it was about to be severed. For from the cross, Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he knew the why. He came for the why. You and I are the why. He loves you that much that that which was most sacred to him, he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to be forsaken that you and I might be forgiven. That's why he is in an absolutely perfect position to be able to sympathize with your troubles. When that big old rock, it seems as it is, it is weighing heavy upon your heart. He understands your troubles. He understands you're overwhelmed. He understands your sorrows because he himself is the man of sorrow. Saying just a moment ago, this is a new hymn. In fact, it has been translated into 12 languages, and it is being premiered internationally on this Easter morning. You were one of the first in the entire world to hear that song sung. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took the crown of thorns, sin of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. See the stone, it's rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be praised. He's risen from the grave. And the same power that raised him from the grave is the same power available to you today to resurrect once more the hope of your heart in spite of the distress of your soul. It is the dilemma of the stone. The accusations, the condemnations, the declarations of criticism against you. Or perhaps the destitution of the resources you no longer have. Or maybe it is the distress of a sorrowful soul. Or, or maybe the dilemma for you this morning is death itself. It was for Jesus, for when he said in Gethsemane that my soul is so overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, it's because he knew he was going to die. He had already predicted it. For Matthew 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. It wasn't a surprise to him. He came to die. And so too did you. From the moment you took your first breath, you were rapidly racing towards the last one that you would take on this earth. For the Bible says that man is destined to die once and then to face the judgment. And quite frankly, if you don't understand this, you and I cannot stand up under that judgment by ourselves. But the good news is we don't have to stand there alone. We have an advocate in Jesus Christ who because of his redeeming work, we need not have to come under the wrath and the judgment of God. Now as an aside, please also understand that the judgment, the wrath of God is not because he is mean and malicious, it's simply because he is holy. And you and I are anything but. But because of what Jesus has done, he was willing 
to take the punishment so that we didn't have to. He was willing to be separated from the Father, though it had been his experience since before time began. He was willing to be separated from the Father temporarily so that you and I didn't have to be separated from him eternally. This is the gift of God. But it must be individually received. So please understand, you've got to decide. What are you going to do with Jesus? Will you receive him or will you reject him? To receive him is as simple as understanding, realizing that he loves you just the way you are. He created you. And yet realizing also, recognizing that you have sinned and your sin cuts you off from a holy God. And so your response needs to be that of repentance, admitting your sin, asking for forgiveness, and by faith receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. If you never have, receive him this morning. You've got to choose to receive or to reject. And if you reject him today and the next day and the next and every day until your life comes to a conclusion, and it may be today, then as much as it will break the heart of God and as much as it grieves me to say so, it will be like a large rock wrapped around your neck and cast into a sea so that your unforgiven sin will drag you deeper and deeper and deeper into a darkened and eternal abyss, eternally separated from God and all that is good. That is not what he wants. But by grace we can be saved. His free gift to us. One of the first verses of Scripture I learned in this church as a little boy was Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The passage goes on to say, since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we now be saved through His life? As Stan prayed just a moment ago, if it was the crucifixion and the tomb and that was all, it wouldn't be enough. Scripture says we are saved through His life. Because I didn't finish that passage in Matthew moments ago. For Jesus, in fact, began to teach them and explain that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, but on the third day be raised to life. The third day, Sunday, the day we call Easter, he would be and he has been raised to life because that big old rock couldn't hold him. The rock could no longer hide him. Although there were those that wanted that rock to do just that. For after that passage in Matthew 27, after the burial on Friday, the next day on Saturday, the chief priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that he, when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. I want to remind you, that's not deception, that's a declaration. That was no mere ploy. That was a promise of Christ himself. After three days, I will rise again. And so they said to Pilate, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he was raised from the dead, and this deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Pilate said, you make that tomb as secure as you possibly humanly can. Jesus can't come out of that tomb. It's got to be rock solid. That two-ton rock has got to remain in place. That's why the women were concerned early, early on Sunday morning, at, shortly after sunrise, when they were on their way to the tomb and they began to ask one another, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? The dilemma of the stone. What's this dilemma? What's that stone in front of your life today? Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But verse 4, when they looked up, they saw the stone which was very large and it had been rolled away. By the way, this is God's version of rock and roll. Right. <laughs> By his power and according to his plan, that rock was rolled away. And while it's not described in Scripture, I have no doubt that before those women arrived, somewhere prior to that in the middle of the night, those guards ran screaming into the darkness, we can't, we can't. Keep him in the tomb, you say. We've tried, but we can't. 
because he's bigger than the tomb. He's bigger than the grave. He's bigger than that big old rock that was rolled in front. He was that day, and I want you to know he is this day. He's bigger than whatever rock you're facing. For on that first Easter, he was bigger than all that hell threw against him. On this Easter morn, he's bigger than all the hell you're up against. He's bigger than death itself, death of yourself or of your spouse or your son or someone who is more precious to you than life itself. He is bigger than the destitution of the resources that you no longer have. For while you may be void of the resources, you're never lacking of his grace and his power. You may be against this stone, but I want you to know he's bigger than the distresses of your soul, the troubles, the sorrows that overwhelm you today. He's bigger than they are. He is bigger than the declaration of those who would pronounce sentences upon you, declarations of criticism and condemnation, because he was bigger than those who were declared against him. Crucify him. Crucify him, they said, and they did. They killed my Jesus, but they weren't big enough to keep him dead. He was bigger than the condemnation of the religious leaders. He was bigger than the crucifixion of the Roman soldiers. He was bigger than the deceit of Judas, the denial of Peter, the desertion of all the disciples. He was bigger than that rock and all that it represented, the futility, the finality, the fear, the failure. He was bigger than death and darkness that was hiding behind that rock. Because on Sunday morning, his risen presence was a proof, and by it he declared, I am bigger than the rock because I am the rock, the rock of ages. Trust in me, he says. Because according to the eternal, holy, and divine script of God, written before the foundations of the world had ever been written. Jesus' response to the dilemma of the stone was his own declaration. I am bigger than because I am the great I am. Stand together. There you are. Sing together. I want to be near. Loving your word. Amen. Loving your word. And hating. Help us, Lord. Dry bones. I want to see dry bones. Living again. Singing as one. Hallelujah.
Let me tell you something. He says to you this morning, I am the great I am. I am bigger than any rock that you're facing. In fact, the fact is, he is the rock of grace upon which you can stand. And so turn to him. Call to him. Trust in him. Day by day, depend upon him. He who is the risen, reigning, and soon returning King of kings and Lord of lords. And as you do that, in resurrection power, go and be his victorious church on this blessed and glorious Easter morn.